All right, so stroke prevention. <clears throat> we have a risk for a clot forming in the appendage, right? So we prevent that with uh, systemic anticoagulation. Warfarin and novel anticoagulants are, are, have been validated as doing the trick for that. And the novel approach is to <laughs> close the left atrial appendage. The Watchman is the only device that is FDA approved for that. There are other devices being tested in clinical trials. The Lariat has been used for that approach, but it's neither approved for that nor validated for that. And then there's surgical approaches to close the appendage. Next. And selecting the right strategy requires individualization of the risks and benefits. Next. Okay, so first, we need to assess the risk of stroke. We use the CHATSVA scoring system that includes a history of congestive heart failure, doesn't say diastolic or, or uh, systolic, uh, hypertension, age, you get two points against you. If you're older than 75, you get one point. If you're older than 65, a prior stroke or TIA, and I would add a systemic embolism uh, counts. The presence of vascular disease and female gender um, are what we count in the CHATS scoring, CHATS scoring system. Next. Um, now, this is the chas score that is validated for AFib. We know the risk of AFib, AFib-related stroke, mechanistically comes from the appendage. Where is this appendage in this risk uh, scoring system? Nowhere. So that's where we have a, a big conceptual challenge. Next. Um, interesting thing, the chas score have been validated. Uh, the, the higher the number, the higher the risk of stroke. Great. Next. Uh, the interesting thing is that for a given chats vast score, you may have very different patients. So let me just show you this example. Um, on the left, these are real patients. Uh, on the left, chats vast score of five. A patient with 66 year old, so you, it's older than 65, she gets one point. She's female, she gets another point. She's diabetic, she gets another point. Hypertensive. She has a calcium score of 450. They did a CT scan, and there's evidence of vascular disease and calcifications in the aorta as well, so she has vascular disease. She's had persistent AFib for two years, long-standing persistent AFib. And when we take her for a cardioversion, we do a TE, and she has an appendix thrombus, which we treat with anticoagulation, and it goes away. So nothing particularly unusual. We see those patients all the time. This patient, <coughs> sure, has a high risk of, of, uh, of stroke from AFib and from the left atrial appendage, right? Look at the next patient. Same chat score, 66, prior strokes. He gets two points for that. Ischemic cardiomyopathy with heart failure. <coughs> and um, and uh, extensive mobile atheromatous plaque in the aortic arch. This patient never had AFib, but they do, they do uh, bypass surgery. And they, he develops persistent AFib after bypass surgery. So he developed post-op AFib day two and was never cardiobated, show up, shows up in my office a month later, he's been in AFib. This patient has a pretty obvious source of, uh, of uh, thromboembolism risk from the atheromatous plaque in the aorta. AFib, you could consider it as, a, as an accident of surgery, but he never had AFib before. This patient, I don't think, you, you may get rid of the you cardiovert and it, and it doesn't recur, the AFib. So you see the patient a year later, and they tell him, hey, uh, do I need anticoagulation? Do I need to close my appendage? It would be ridiculous to close the appendage on that patient. There's nothing to indicate that this patient has a specifically a high risk of stroke coming from the appendage, whereas the other patient did. And when I saw them, both of them had a FIB, both of them had a chat score of five. And I haven't, and these patients were okay with anticoagulation, but imagine that uh, this patient has, whatever, GI bleed up on, uh, you know, two weeks of Eliquis. Am I going to close the appendage on that patient? Well, these are the kind of patients that unfortunately are getting the appendage closed, and then we'll, we'll see how this appendage closure is getting abused. But uh, if you want to be responsible physicians, you just need to think beyond the numbers and think beyond these, these categories, and just nothing replaces a thoughtful uh, clinician. Um, it's important to discern the two categories, even for the same risk of stroke. Next. Um, when we use uh, warfarin or NOACs, this is a complex 
a slide, but basically we summarize here all the effects of, of warfarin and NOACs as far as reducing ischemic stroke, which they are kind of close. Uh, basically, both aspirin and NOACs drop the risk of stroke to about 1%, one, anyway, between 1 and 1.4% per, uh, per year. Uh, the risk of hemorrhagic stroke is better reduced by NOAC compared to uh, as warfarin. The risk of bleeding is, in general, less with NOACs, particularly with uh, apixaban. And mortality uh, was only significantly reduced uh, in the apixaban trial. Um, the bottom line is warfarin does not as good as NOACs, but well enough, and it's, it's here to stay. Uh, in general, I don't start a new patient on warfarin, but I don't, I don't change patients on warfarin that I've been doing okay. I don't change them over NOACs. Next. Uh, okay, appendage closure. These are the different gadgets that are being studied. Obviously, this is a, a big business for industry. Uh, Watchman is this one. appendage. On the left is the Amplatz device or ACP plug or amulet as they call it now. And like I said, this is a very potentially very lucrative aspect of medicine and there's a lot of gadgets being developed and at different stages of, of, of validation. Next. Boston makes it. Well, actually, it was developed by another company but Boston purchased it. Um, the the concept is simple enough. You put a sheath here loaded with the Watchman device that has these bars that hook on the tissue. And it's on through a, a femoral puncture. <clears throat> you have to do a TE to measure the appendage size because appendages come as variable as your fingerprints. So you, you have to individualize the treatment and the approach. Uh, but through the femoral vein, you get into the right atrium, then you do a transeptal puncture, get into um, the left atrium, you do a, that's the idea there, but you do an angiogram, you inject contrast, you assess the morphology of the appendage, and then um, as you close the transept, you close it, you cross the septum, you got to be careful with how you cross it. There's a few technical aspects. It's not, in most patients, it's not a big deal to, to get it done. Um, in some can be impossible, uh, depending on the size and shape and anatomy of the appendage. You use a pigtail to um, engage the appendage because you don't want to perforate. This tissue can be very, very frail and very thin. And, and like I said, there's different morphologies the broccoli, chicken wing, and windsock, these are silly numbers, silly, silly terms, because there's just as many as, as 7 billion individuals. Um, but you put a sheath in the appendage, <coughs> and you have those markers, then you load the watchman, and that's when it gets tricky, because the watchman, when it's collapsed in the sheath, is quite stiff. Um, depending on the size, you, can, you need to get deeper or more shallow into the appendage and you take, you take uh, contrast injections, so, which means that you cannot have a thrombus in the appendix when you do this. Uh, it has to be clean, which means that the, higher, the highest risk patients still have a problem. Uh, this is not, obviously, for everybody. But once you have the watchman loaded there, this is where it gets tricky, because since you're very deep, this is very sharp and can perforate. And then you deploy like that. Next, we don't, we don't need to. How well does it do? Well, it was compared in two randomized trials, the Protect AFib and the Prevail study, uh, which we were part of. And the this, this studies were designed to measure outcomes as far as efficacy. Efficacy was a combination of all stroke or systemic embolism, subdivided in ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, or um, um, strokes that were beyond so seven days post-implant to eliminate procedure-related strokes. Cardiovascular mortality or unexplained death, all-cause death, major bleed, <coughs> major bleed not procedure-related. 
So as far as efficacy, you know, it was just as good as, as warfarin, perhaps favoring warfarin, but not significant. All stroke was nearly identical. And it was interesting. The, the ischemic stroke was actually higher in the watchman uh, groups. Uh, again, P of 0 0.05, so you could argue whether that's significant or almost, but the biggest improvement on the Watchman was a reduction, 80, near 80% 80 reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. So Watchman is very good at preventing hemorrhagic strokes created by warfarin. So it's very good at, elim at eliminating the risk of iatrogenesis. Is that good enough? I don't know. Uh, ischemic strokes beyond uh, seven days uh, favor warfarin as well, but again, crossing the unity line. Um, the interesting thing is cardiovascular unexplained death was more than 50% reduced because those hemorrhagic strokes that warfarin causes tend to be the most, the, the ones with the highest morbidity and mortality. So you, if you get rid of those, you do really well. And the, basically, you could argue, and it has been argued, and there's still controversy about this, that um, all that the watchman does is eliminate the risk of iatrogenesis and perhaps with <coughs> uh, more data and perhaps we had a higher, a higher risk population for hemorrhagic strokes in the PROTECT AF studies. For whatever reason, this is what drove the FDA approval of the watchman. Next. And um, bleeding is obviously less. Now, bleeding is tricky because if you look at bleeding <coughs> after six months of a Watchman implant, where the patients are only taking aspirin, then bleeding is much worse when you take warfarin, a 71% reduction. But the problem is when you implant the Watchman, you have to be on aspirin and warfarin for at least 45 days. Then at 45 days, you do a TE. If there's no clot and the Watchman is well seated, then you stop the warfarin and you start aspirin and Plavix for four and a half months. <clears throat> and it's only four and a half months that you switch to just aspirin. So during those six months, a lot of patients may bleed, because if the patients have a very high risk of bleeding, then you get in trouble. Um, and it's only when you reach to that destination therapy that the watchman does give you the benefit. Next. Uh, of course, this comes with a, a risk of procedural problems, procedural complications. It was very high, the procedural risks were very high, almost 10% uh, having a, a a safety event during the procedure in the first half of the first study, the PROTECT AF. I blame it, in, I blame it on uh, the fact that they use interventionalists to do this procedure. But the bottom line is uh, the, there were a lot of issues. The transeptal uh, puncture, all we know, we know now how to do it optimally for the watchman. We take, we benefit, go back, we benefit a lot from the experience of previous operators now. Risks of the, of the uh, device implant now in the post-marketing study, is actually 2.5% risk of safety events. So the, the, the procedure has become very safe uh, because we have learned from the mistakes of previous operators and we, take, we have bene the benefit of, of uh, this collective experience. The bottom line is that <clears throat> for this procedure to succeed, obviously you cannot have a high risk of procedural complications because then you, get in, you just get in trouble. Another problem to be to be uh, discerned now is what is the, uh, prob the implication of device-related thrombus. A fair amount of patients, uh, perhaps anywhere between 2 to 4% of the patients that get a watchman may develop a clot on the watchman, which is basically creating the very problem you're trying to prevent. <clears throat> and in that scenario, the risk of stroke goes up by four times. So it's a little bit of a mess. Um, and that's still the optimal management, the optimal surveillance. Um, Understanding which patient is at risk of having a watchman-related thrombus is still yet to be defined. So the story is not over with appendage occlusion. Um, we have the watchman approved. We have the uh, amulet on a, on a randomized clinical trial. We have another JNJ product uh, being studied. We have a Medtronic uh, and a Chinese company with another design. The field may change dramatically in the next five years. So we'll see. Next, <clears throat> a few things about anticoagulation in specific disease recombination, or a few things about stroke protection. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very important. You don't care about the CHATVA score. They need anticoagulation, period. Also, we haven't talked about valvular AFib, because all these studies, the validation of warfarin and NOACs 
was done in patients with non-valvular AFib. But if you have mitral stenosis and you have AFib in the context of severe mitral stenosis and rheumatic disease particularly, you need anticoagulation because you have also an atrial myopathy at the same time. So forget about the chats by scoring those two scenarios. And uh, uh, other things about it, I don't, the, the, key, the key message was that. Next. All right, so <clears throat> to summarize, um, it's very easy when to make decisions as to how to manage uh, certain patients with extreme, extreme scenarios. If the patient has had an appendix thrombus, obviously you cannot mess around in there. You cannot put the sheaths. You cannot do contrast injections. You cannot do any of these watchman occlusions, appendix occlusions. So you have to go on to, with anticoagulation no matter what. And I have to say that my experience, the NOACs don't do as well as, <clears throat> as warfarin in dissolving uh, an appendix uh, thrombus. Um, I've had patients with uh, antiphospholipid syndrome and hypercoagulable states in which basically the clot never went away until we kept the patient on, on INRs of three, between three and four for a month, and then they went away. <clears throat> but some patients are particularly tricky, and warfarin is still here to stay. In general, out of those extreme uh, risks, uh, first choice of treatment is still the novel anticoagulants. That's what I, what I start patients on. Um, but warfarin is here to stay. A lot of patients will have financial constraints. Uh, sorry for the typo. Uh, some patients may need to pay $600 a month for a NOAC. So if they tolerate warfarin, it's, it's they're cheap and it does a good trick, especially if you have stable INRs and no bleeding and a good tolerance to it. But if you have issues <clears throat> with bleeding, if you have uh, a stroke on anticoagulation, so that's anticoagulation failure. If you have a previous hemorrhagic stroke, where you cannot, in theory, could afford the risk of another one, and you have a, high, a good procedural candidacy as far as being able to undergo a half an hour procedure, uh, then the watchman does a good job. And of course, if you qualify for any of the new clinical trials, then by all means, uh, we encourage participation in those. Uh, but like I said, uh, anticoagulation is, is the first line of treatment with NOACs. Warfarin is good for patients that tolerate it. And appendage occlusion is good for selected patients. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>